Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report on NTD Television. I'm Steve Lance. Here's a look at some of the stories we've been covering for you today. President Biden is faced with a dilemma. What to do with previously allocated funds for Afghanistan? Today, he divided those funds, sending half to victims of 9-11 and the other half to the country to help the Afghan people. But could the money get into the wrong hands of the Taliban? And President Biden has called for all American citizens to evacuate Ukraine. Does this mean that a Russian invasion is imminent? We'll take a look. Nine Democrat-led states have announced a rollback on their mask mandates this week. What are President Biden's thoughts on that? We'll tell you in just a moment. Russia could invade Ukraine as early as next week. The White House is warning today. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan is encouraging Americans to leave Ukraine as soon as possible. Any American in Ukraine should leave as soon as possible and in any event in the next 24 to 48 hours. Sullivan warns that an invasion could happen at any time and that it is likely to begin with airstrikes. It could begin during the Olympics, uh, despite a lot of speculation uh, that it would only happen after the Olympics. President Biden today spoke with other world leaders, and according to Sullivan, NATO is united. Should Russia choose to take military action, our response would include severe economic sanctions with similar packages imposed by the European Union, the United Kingdom, Canada, and other countries. Sullivan says that Biden is expected to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin over the phone. The U.S. estimates that Russia has more than 100,000 troops near the Ukraine border with thousands more added this week. President Biden today divided up frozen Afghan funds. Half of the money will go to the families who were victims of the 9-11 attacks, the other half to the Afghan people. This is the president is now rejecting claims by top military officials that his administration acted too slowly to evacuate troops and civilians during the drawdown that killed 13 Marines last August. NTD's Melina Wisecup reports. President Biden's handling of foreign affairs is under the microscope. Today, the president took new action on Afghanistan, signing an executive order to divide frozen Afghan funds. Seven billion dollars sitting in the Afghan Central Bank in New York will be split in half. Three and a half billion will go to families of the 9-11 victims. And this executive order aims to create a legal way to get that money into the hands of those families. The other three and a half billion will go to help the Afghan people who are now struggling under Taliban rule. This money will provide life necessities like water, shelter and health care. Despite the backlash from both parties, President Biden is doubling down on his strategy for the withdrawal. Last night on NBC's Nightly News, Biden directly rejected criticism from top military officials who said the administration ignored the facts on the ground. No. That's not what I was told. I'm rejecting them. What I was told, no one told me that, look, there was no good time to get out. And a new report today from the Wall Street Journal that the Taliban is holding at least nine people in Kabul, including one American, a U.S. resident, and British citizens. Melina, Biden's move to divide up this money uh, today comes as there's mounting pressure on the administration to help those left behind in Afghanistan. So, Melina, what more can you tell us on how the White House plans to use this money? Well, the White House describes this as an ongoing effort to address that growing humanitarian and economic crisis in Afghanistan. And to get that money moving, the administration is asking a judge for permission to move billions of dollars into a trust fund to help the Afghan people. And the White House describes this executive order as designed to keep that money from getting into the hands of the Taliban. Steve? Thanks for that, Melina. President Biden has announced that the aid for Afghanistan will now be split to support victims of 9-11, but there's still a concern that part of that money will wind up in the hands of the Taliban. Here to discuss, we have James Carafano of the Heritage Foundation. James Carafano, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report. Good to be with you. Now, James, first, I'd like to ask you, President Biden is expected to order uh, splitting uh, af funds that were allocated to Afghanistan uh, to compensate 9-11 victims. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, you know, I certainly think it's appropriate to compensate uh, victims. I don't necessarily have uh, an, an issue with that. You know, of course, these are Afghan resources that 
were not that had nothing to do with with 9/11. In some ways, I suspect it's almost kind of like a, a bribe because who's going to object to reimbursing victims of 9/11? Of course, everybody's for that. Then the other half goes to humanitarian efforts in Afghanistan, which are actually only necessary because of the debacle of how we left Afghanistan. People wouldn't be starving in Afghanistan today. We wouldn't have a massive humanitarian crisis if the Biden administration hadn't abandoned the Afghan people the way they did. So this is a crisis that he created. And I think the concerns with shifting humanitarian funds to Afghanistan is how much of this will wind up in the hands of the Taliban or be controlled by the Taliban or influenced by the Taliban. And so what we're doing is going back to en enabling, enriching and empowering a group which is oppressing its own people and the people are starving because of this administration. James, I'd like to ask you about Russia and Ukraine. Uh, tension has been building. Uh, it, it continues to build. Biden has just warned American citizens to leave Ukraine and that things could potentially go south at any moment. How do you read this and what should we expect to see? Well, I clearly think we are at the inflection point. Uh, everything is in place. And, and now, really, we're just waiting to see what Putin decides. You know, I will say it's it's pretty clear. I don't think there would be a crisis today if, and I don't mean this in a partisan way, I'm not political, I don't even belong to a political party, but I think if Biden was not president today, we wouldn't have a crisis. N Putin never tried anything like this um, under President Trump He's testing the United States because he thinks we're weak and his ambitions go far beyond the Ukraine. Um, if you look at what the response has been from both Europe and NATO and the United States in the run up to this, I don't think that it's been sufficient to deter Putin's actions. So what Putin does now is entirely up to Putin and will entirely be based on his cost benefit assessment of the risks and costs of uh, military action uh, versus the the of just kind of pocketing where he is and going home. And the, to me, this is the last thing you want to be in as a, a statesman is involved in a confrontation where essentially you have you're waiting on the other person to decide what they want to do, and you've demonstrated very little capacity to really uh, influence that. Now, Secretary Blinken is on his Asia trip right now, engaging with some Indo-Pacific allies. Uh, between Russia and China, who do you think presents a greater threat to the U.S.? Well, I, you know, I often get this question, and my response is like the guy who goes to a doctor, and the doctor says, you got a bad heart, and you got a brain tumor, and you got cancer. You know, which one do you want me to cure? And you're like, well, doc, they can all kill me, so it's kind of a problem. The, the problem is, is, is both Russia and China, and for that matter, Iran, represent significant threats to U.S. interests, and the U.S. can't really afford to ignore any of them. And and many of their interests are actually complementary, whether they're actively colluding or not really doesn't matter. You know, Europe's a good example. The number one cheerleader for Russian activity to destabilize and divide Europe is China. China would love to deal with a weakened and divided Europe. They'd love to see the United States isolated and pushed out of Europe. So as far as the Chinese are concerned, the Russians are doing their business for them. So I think trying to parse this and say, well, we have to worry about China and therefore we can't worry about Russia or Iran, um, that actually is playing into China's hands. Matter of fact, the one thing I'm not hearing that we should be hearing is here you have the Chinese in the UN Security Council publicly at the Olympics, basically siding with Russia, saying it is OK that Russia threatens and coerces Western Europe. I think the Chinese should pay a price for that they should be held accountable and be responsible for Russian actions because they're supporting and enabling them. James Carafano, thank you. Thanks for having me. Two U.S. senators on the Intelligence Committee are calling for transparency over the CIA's collecting of vast amounts of information on American citizens. This comes after the CIA declassified some documents at their request. Based on released documents, Senators Ron Wyden and Martin Heinrich warned Thursday that the CIA has a secret bulk collection program to get Americans' data. The Senators are also concerned about how the agency searches and handles the information. Last April, the two Senators sent a letter to the Director of National Intelligence and the head of the CIA. They were asking for more details about the program for it to be declassified. They said the program operated, quote, 
outside the statutory framework that Congress and the public believe govern this collection. The CIA released a series of redacted recommendations about the program. Large parts of the documents were blacked out. And West Virginia Senator Shelley Capito has tested positive for the CCP virus. Her office released a statement saying that she is not experiencing any symptoms. Her test results have come after a routine test. Capito is among a group of Congress members that recently experienced breakthrough infections. Others include Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Congressman Tom Malinowski. Nevada becomes the latest state to join a new wave of dropping mask mandates. And President Biden is walking a line between CDC guidelines and Democratic governors racing to change their mask policies this week. Here's Biden speaking with NBC's Lester Holt. It's hard to say whether they're wrong. Here's the science is saying now that masks work, masks make a difference. During an interview on Thursday, Biden refrained from criticizing Democratic governors who went against federal masking guidelines. On the same day, Governor Steve Sisolak announced an end to Nevada's statewide mask mandate, saying he doesn't want to let unvaccinated people hold back the rest of the society and the economy. He is the ninth Democratic governor announcing plans this week to drop the mask mandates. Some analysts say it's due to political pressure from the general public in those states. Earlier this week, Dr. Lena Wen, a CNN health expert, also called for an end to government-imposed mask mandates, adding it should be up to the parents to decide whether to mask their children. Republican lawmakers have called for lifting mask mandates for a long time. The CDC hasn't changed its indoor masking guidelines as of yet. And the FDA announced today that it is postponing next week's public meeting to review Pfizer's COVID vaccine for children under five. They say they want to see more data. The meeting was originally scheduled on February 15th. And Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers and 70 House Republicans have sent a letter to President Biden and Health Secretary Javier Becerra. They're urging the administration to end the COVID public health emergency. The letter states that the Chinese regime's virus cover-up prompted an emergency response two years ago. The congressman now urges Biden to, quote, accept that COVID-19 is endemic, recognize that current heavy-handed government interventions are doing more harm than good, and immediately begin the process by which we unwind the public health emergency so our country can get back to normal. Rogers opposes vaccine and mask mandates and lockdown policies. She says lockdowns hurt businesses, disrupt children's education, and contribute to more drug abuse and suicides. Arizona's attorney general has just issued a powerful statement on the southern border. Could his declaration be the start of border states taking matters into their own hands when it comes to illegal immigration? And the Chinese Communist Party is seeking to dominate the world. That's the warning from Secretary of State Antony Blinken. He's calling on Western allies to resist. One major cause of death for young people in America is originating in China and slipping through our poorest southern border. Over 100 Republicans have signed a letter to President Joe Biden urging him to take action. Arizona Attorney General Mark Burnovich has just made a significant statement when it comes to the southern border. He says the Constitution gives border state governors the right to act unilaterally without the blessing of the federal government when facing an invasion. Our next guest, Russ Vogt, is president at the Center for Renewing America. Russ has been instrumental in providing a constitutional basis for governors to act in the best interest of their states, and we sat down with him earlier. Russ Vogt, thank you so much for joining us in the Capitol Report. Good to have you. Now, Russ, uh, Arizona AG Mark Burnovich, he just issued a very significant uh, legal opinion regarding the southern border um, in the United Mm -hmm. States. Your organization was involved in this. Please tell us how you were involved and what this means. Sure. Well, very historic action this week. We have a real crisis along our border, record apprehensions. The drug cartels are basically in operational control of our border. Uh, massive amounts of drugs are coming across the southern border. And so from the standpoint of where we are as a country, we're no longer in a position where the country can just wait 
three years to have a, a, a potential for a new administration to come in, into power. Um, this administration has an ideologically open border policy. They refuse to execute the law. And so we, what we have said is that we have to have Republican governors doing everything they can, all border governors, but the hope is that Republican governors will do it. Uh, we got to use these governors to be able to say what is the maximum that the Constitution allows for them to do. Um, and we believe that as a result of what constitutes an invasion along the southern border, southern border, and we look back at the Constitution and say, what did the founders mean when they, they looked at an invasion? It wasn't just foreign uh, nation states. It was uh, bandits, gangs, uh, large groups of people that it was hard to get a handle on from a security standpoint. And we've said that constitutes an invasion, that the Constitution then says there are self-help provisions to allow them to defend their people and keep them safe. Now that's just it. Whose responsibility is it to declare an invasion? Is it a political party? Is it public opinion? Uh, it sounds like what you're doing is providing some clarity on this issue. We are. I mean, I think, you know, politicians have talked about it as being an invasion. The question is, legally, did it meet that test? Uh, we've said it did. Uh, Mark Brnovich has now said it did, but th the responsibility is now on the governor of Arizona and the governor of Texas to be able to say, we're going to, we're going to articulate that legally uh, th we have this responsibility as commanders in chief of our state to be able to give rules of engagement to our National Guards or the Department of Public Safety or the sheriffs and say, interdict and remove individuals back to Mexico. Uh, and to be able to stop the flow of illegal immigration as a result. And we believe they have that authority. The pressure is on squarely on these governors. They're the ones that have to say, all right, the case has been made. The legal authority has been uh, uh, declared. Now we actually have to go and execute. Thus far, they have not been willing to do that. Our hope is that the American people rise up in, in unison and say, we need you to do this. I mean, objectively, just listening, it just sounds so reasonable, and it does sound like something the American people would mm -hmm. truly be, you know, it would cross partisan lines. Um, with that said, is there a scenario that you see where Republican border governors would not take this action, and why would that be? You know, I think we're winning this debate. We're in the middle of this, of this process right now. Uh, I have uh, my hopes that we get to the point where we can convince these, these two Republican governors who are most likely to take this plan up. Uh, but you know, even if uh, Governor Doug Ducey does not do this in Arizona, uh, the candidates who are running to replace him uh, are committing themselves to this position. And so our view is that come next year, uh, this this will happen in Arizona. And our view is if it happens in Arizona, it's going to put massive pressure on Texas to do it. And then one those once those two states, those are two out of the three big uh, uh, areas for illegal immigration, that puts a lot of pressure on the other two states that are led by Democrat governors. I mean, we are, we are a nonpartisan organization. We want to make sure that this happens. Uh, and so we are going to where we have the best shot immediately to, to make the case to governors. But our view is that over time, uh, this is something that will have a domino effect. Now, Texas Congressman Chip Roy has introduced legislation to designate cartels as terrorist organizations mm -hmm. to be able to deal with them as such. What are your thoughts on doing that? I think it's an important effort. I mean, I think we have to really understand the extent to which the cartels are not just you know the, the 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 types of criminal organizations that have existed for many decades they really are a a national security threat and i think the extent to which the members of congress are kind of trying to provide the federal government with new tools to treat that security threat uh, as such is is paramount and how we do it given the fact that the cartels have such a, a huge swath of the country um, I think will be critical and we'll, we'll, we'll want to participate in making sure it's done right. And so that's one of the things we're trying to do and we're thrilled that members of Congress like Chip Roy are doing that as well. Russ Vogt, thank you. My pleasure. The United Nations announces that two UN journalists and Afghan nationals working with them have been detained in Kabul. The journalists were on assignment with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees. Taliban spokesman says that the regime has no information about the journalists and that they're assisting in trying to find out what happened to them. Afghanistan has seen a wave of arbitrary arrest, missing person cases, 
and widespread hunger since the Taliban takeover last August. The Chinese Communist Party is seeking to form a new world order that will allow it to dominate the world. That's according to Secretary of State Antony Blinken. He says China is becoming more aggressive internationally and more repressive domestically. Blinken is visiting Australia for the Quad Security Dialogue. He told The Australian, a national newspaper in the country, that China's ambition over time is to be the leading military, economic, diplomatic and political power, not just in the region but in the world. He's calling on Australia and other like-minded nations to resist this behavior together with the United States. On Thursday, Wisconsin Congressman Brian Steele led 116 Republicans on a letter to President Biden urging action on fentanyl coming from China and across the southern border. Fentanyl Schedule I classification for drugs that have no acceptable medical use and a high potential for abuse is about to expire on February 18th. Steele wants the classification to be permanent. He says fentanyl kills more people aged 18 to 45 than car accidents, suicide, or COVID-19, and that it is 100 times more potent than morphine. Steele also urges Biden to secure the southern border. That's all we have for you on the Capitol Report this evening. I'm your host, Steve Lance. Thank you for tuning in. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next week.